Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Metachan Assembly of God. I am glad to be back here after a brief period of vacation. And I know that some of you missed me and some of you did not miss me. That doesn't matter. Yeah, it's good. It's good. If you missed me, then you're in my good books. I do not have to say anything else. So let's pray and begin this morning. Father in heaven, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Father, we thank you for this amazing love this morning. We thank you for your death on the cross. Father, I pray that this morning you will speak as much as you have spoken into me, that your dear people, your dear children will listen, will hear the voice of the Heavenly Father speaking to them. Father, let their spirits be stirred I pray that every distraction from the enemy would be removed in the name of Jesus. And I bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. I know, Lord, that we are going to deal with a heavy subject. And there is an enemy of our souls that seek to destroy us, to steal away our joy, to in order that we will not be able to have that abundant life that you have promised. I pray that you will bless each and every one with your presence as they hear your word and give them the ability to respond to what they hear. Give them the ability that they will say, yes, God, I am your child. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be starting a series called The Gospel Unplugged. The Gospel Unplugged. What do I mean by saying the gospel unplugged? The word unplugged means removing it from all amplification. It's usually used in the context of music. When an instrument is being played, when it is plugged into an electrical supply, what happens? The sound is amplified. But then when it is played without anything, it's just plain and it's called acoustic. It's a cappella, like singing without any music. Just plain. Why did I choose that word, the gospel unplugged? As we all know, the word gospel means good news. It's good news. But over the period of time and centuries, and especially because we have actually undergone a technological revolution, in this age of communication and information explosion, this word gospel has taken a battering and it has begun to lose its very message. Because you begin to hear gospel. Christian television is rampant out there. Anytime you switch on, there is even a reality preaching TV show. You have so much that is being bombarded at you. And what has happened is, we become very clouded in our thinking. And if we go and ask somebody, Brother, would you please explain to me what gospel is? What is a gospel? What is the good news? And usually the response you get is, oh, the good news is that, well, uh, I was having this particular problem. I had this illness or I was caught into this addiction and then I did not know where to go. So I came, some people said, oh, Jesus will be your remedy. Come to Jesus. So I came to Jesus, and Jesus set me free, and all my life has turned around. It's become very rosy. I mean, that can be given by any program outside. 
A rehabilitation program. You go enter the program, people will give you that remedy. Is that the real meaning of gospel, the good news? Let me establish for you. When you say good news, you, you see people, many people coming and saying, oh, do you want to hear good news or bad news? Which one do you want me to give you first? Good news, may I propose to you, is really good news only when you understand the worst or the bad situation that you are in. It's like a doctor coming to you and already have given you a diagnosis that it's all done and gone. It's going to be finished for you. That's the bad news. You've received it. You're seated there. You do not know what to do. And suddenly, after uh, maybe a few minutes, he comes back and says, I've got good news for you. In fact, I looked at the wrong diagnosis. It was the wrong x-ray I looked at. I'm sorry. You've got so many years to live ahead of you. When the doctor tells you that, you know how much you're going to bubble in your heart? Because you heard the bad news that you're going to die. And suddenly he comes and tells you, no, you've got life. Good news is really good news only when you understand the badness of your situation. So with that being said, I'm going to read the text this morning. It comes from Romans chapter 1. I'm not going to be reading all the verses. I'm going to be reading some verses, and I've given you notes to follow. Let me first give you an introduction of the book of Romans. This book of Romans, written by the Apostle Paul in the first century to the Roman Christians, is one of the most important and Powerful books in the scripture. I want to qualify when I say when I say the most important and powerful. Because the whole of scripture is important. From Genesis to Revelation contains the good news. But when I say it's the most important, if you want to understand what the real good news is, all concentrated in 13, in 16 chapters, you got to go to Romans. And many times when we read the book of Romans, we scratch our heads, it becomes very difficult to understand. It's one of the most outstanding literary books of the first century. It's, this status has been given even by secular literature artists. They said this is one of the most outstanding literature ever written. And if you want to improve your English, and I did want to, I wanted to read more and more of Romans. It's so outstanding that at times it misses. We, we forget where we are. We do not understand and we bypass so many things. But with that being said, the second reason why this is one of the most important books is that this contributed to the conversion of a couple of key people in the 18th century when the real essence of the gospel was not understood. One was Martin Luther. Martin Luther's conversion experience came through the book of Romans. Augustine, he's called the father of our faith, one of the fathers of our faith. His conversion came in reading Romans. Otherwise, we will all be Catholics. Catholicism, in which Martin Luther was, he started, he's the father of Protestantism, it is called. Protestant. He protested and said, that is not the way. This is the way. Because he was struggling with the soul with regard to salvation. So that is the introduction for Romans. So with that being said, let's see what Paul writes about the gospel. I'm going to be reading 
from verse 14. From verses 1 through 13, he gives an introduction. He talks about why he is writing. But let me read for you first three verses and then jump to 14. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verses 1 through 4. In these four verses, he encapsulates the whole gospel message. Follow with me. The gospel that was promised beforehand, it was not an afterthought. It was a promise that was being delivered. And if you, know, if you want to know what was the promise, when did it start? Go to Genesis. Genesis 3.15 it started. And then it gets unfurled. It's being unveiled. And then here he's saying, this was the gospel promised beforehand. How? Through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Read the whole of the Old Testament. All the prophets. They all point to Jesus. They all point to redemption. Regarding whom? His son, who as to his human nature, was a descendant of David. He came in the human flesh. He was a descendant of a human being, a king who lived, who was in fact a prototype of Christ. And who, through the spirit of holiness, he refers to the Holy Spirit, the gospel of God, the son who came through the descendant of David, the spirit of holiness. And right here you see, he captures the uniqueness of our Christian faith, and that is that we worship and adore a Trinitarian God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is not just Jesus. Jesus only does not encapsulate the gospel. People make a mistake. It is not only the Father. It's not only the Holy Spirit. It is God the Father enacting in the Son through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God why? By his resurrection from the dead. And the person of the gospel is Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me read for you from verse 14. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. And this is the key verse that contributed to to the conversion of Martin Luther. It's coming in here, these two verses. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the key verse or the nucleus of the entire book of even Romans. He is making the proposition. He is saying, you know why I am writing this book to you? Why I am writing this letter to you? Why am I doing all this that I am doing in my life? I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. You do not stop there. You read the next verse as well. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. And this is where Martin Luther's conversion is crucial. He understood this part, and he was struggling. How can I, a human being sinful as I am, stand before this holy God. How can I? How can I be reconciled? How can I even talk to him? 
He was battling and that's why they had those indulgences that they had to do in order to seek the favor of God. Martin Luther was agonizing in his soul and when he read this, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. He said he's lost. He thought that's it, I'm done. Because I know that this is a righteous God, this is a holy God, I cannot reach him, I cannot stand before him, I cannot face him. Because the righteousness of God is revealed in this gospel. So bad is the situation that I, can, I have nothing inside of me that I can even go and stand before God. And then he read, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The moment he heard it, he said, he erupted in joy in his soul because he knew, he knew that the righteous will live by faith. It is not his righteousness. He need not do anything in order to gain the standing before God. But it was the righteousness. And that is the good news. And that is the good news that comes through Jesus. So, God's revelation... God's revelation. Once he proposes that this is the gospel, he's saying why he's not ashamed of the gospel. He gives the details. Then he goes on to say God, about God's revelation. And what is God's revelation? And you have to read. I'm, I, I will not be able to read everything, but I'm going to read certain verses, and I'll give you those points that I want you to write down in the notes. God's revelation, verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God, I have to stop. The wrath of God, the anger of God, the judgment of God. How many places have you been, have you heard this being preached? <coughs> that there is a God who was angry, who wanted to judge human kind. If you preach this, people will not want to hear. Why do I want to hear about a God who is going to judge people? Is he not supposed to be a loving God, a merciful God, a God who is so affectionate, he, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Again, you see the word there. You see this idea that man will perish. Man will be destroyed. The only begotten son was given that man should not be destroyed, that he should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see the idea of the wrath of God, even in that most wonderful verse that we all quote, John 3.16. And do you know that in this one book, Romans, in this one letter, this idea of the wrath of God is mentioned by Paul ten times, and I do not have time to show you through. And I have, I read this book from Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a great expositor in the 20th century. He worked at the Westminster Chapel in London. He was a medical doctor, and then he became the vicar of that church. Amazing book where he, he exposes, he writes about one verse, just this one word, the wrath of God, he's writing 100 pages. And just one chapter is 309 pages. And I've got just 30 minutes to tell you this. And in fact, Pastor Dave was very grateful. He said, I'll give you one hour today. If you go more than an hour, then I'll have to do something about it. <laughs> May I just take a drop of water? Thank you. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God, the revelation of God, about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, 
His eternal power and divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So, the two blanks right here. God's revelation, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. There is no excuse for anyone on this planet Earth because God has revealed himself through creation. His eternal power, the power that he always had, has created this beautiful world, the creation. Of which man was put in charge. If you want to stand in awe of this God, you got to go to those places to see the awesomeness, the grandeur, the majesty. And God gave us the privilege this last summer when we were on our vacation to be at Grand Canyon. The majesty, the splendor, it scares you when you stand next to the cliff. When you look down, you know that you're dead. You can. <laughs> it's so scary. Amazing sight. When you look at the roaring of the waves, have you seen the waves roaring one after the other? As, as beautiful as it looks, just imagine you being caught inside of that. There is a scariness attached even to the beauty, the marvel of God's creation. And how can a man, even after seeing that, cannot believe in a God who created it? And that is why he says, men are without excuse. His eternal power, divine nature, being seen by what has been made. It's out there. You can see it. So if you do not acknowledge it, it is your decision. It's your decision. You are responsible. I am responsible. Going on. Mankind's response. Verses 21. For although they knew God by what has been made, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile or futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. What did man do? Number one, mankind's response, self-deification, self-glory or self-seeking. They did not want to give this credit to this God. That this is a God, there is a God who created this. He's a God who created me. How wonderful you have been made so fearfully and so wonderfully you are made. You have been made. Do you know that there are so many spare parts in your body? You need only one kidney. You need only one lung sometimes. You don't even need a gallbladder to live. You, you don't even need a uterus. Unless after the, the job is done, you can take it off. You can still live. There's so much inside of you that's been created. There are spare parts. Even if one loses, one is gone, the other one will function. It will take over, it will function, and you can live for long. Why do I say that? Because I've, I've known people who have lived with one kidney. I've known people who have lived with one lung. I've seen them. And people even without limbs, they live. They move. How can you not adore a God who's created you so wonderfully and beautifully? Although they knew God, self-deification, and second thing, ungrateful. 
they did not want to give thanks to him. How many times we all fall under the trap of not being grateful to God for what he has given. And we are always looking for something else. We are always looking for something else. We always want more. We always want the next thing. Ungrateful. It says, they did not give him thanks. And then their thinking became foolish. Their hearts were darkened. And then, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they started doing things. That is mankind's response. Self-deification, ungrateful. Quickly, God's judgment. So, the wrath of God is being revealed. That's how Paul started. Now we are going through what did the wrath of God do? Meaning the judgment of God on mankind. You want to see this. This is God's judgment on mankind. So because man did not give him glory, and because man was not grateful, he did not believe in a God by the things that were seen, that were created. This is what God is doing. Therefore, therefore, because of all of this, and I want to take your attention back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. There was a time in the century when... People were living wicked lives. And this is what God said. I will not strive with the spirit of man forever. I will not contend with man forever. Meaning, we are not as equal. That's the first thing that you and I will have to understand. As much as he has given us this privilege of calling him Abba, Father, we are not as equal. We are not equal to God. He is a great God. We need to bow in humility and adoration before him. We are nothing. If he decides he can strike us down, even now, one moment, he's got eternal power. We do not realize how good is the good news, how wicked we have become. So what's happening here is this. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. So when we read this word sinful desires, he's referring to the sinful nature. And you look back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. When God created Adam and Eve, sinless perfection, walking in the garden with the Father, enjoying fellowship, one simple instruction was given. One simple instruction was given. And that was, do not eat of this one tree. Everything else was given to him to enjoy. But do not eat of this one tree. One fruit, which is in the center of the garden. Just one instruction. Just one instruction. He was made... He was given dominion over the animals. He was made in charge. Everything was given to him. He even had a wife called Eve. And we all know the story, how the serpent comes in. And this is where, when we say, when we read this word, sinful desires of their hearts, what actually is the essence of that word is, God gives in to the longings of your heart as much as if your longings are for him, for his goodness, he will give and he will fulfill the desires of your heart. The same way, the evil desires of your heart, if we keep on asking for it, if we keep on wanting that, he will give in at the end. He will say, all right, you have it. I have already said this is not good for you. It's like how a child or somebody keeps on asking you, I want this, I want this, I want this. And you resist. You say, it's not good, it's not good, it's not good. And as a father, father, after a period of time, what do you do? Okay, go ahead, just have it. Go ahead, just have it. I'm not happy, but go ahead. It's not my desire, but go ahead. And one of the illustrations that I can draw from coming from the yeast is that we grew up in a way or in a time when um, choosing your own partner for marriage was just not in vogue at that time. You just can't. 
If people choose their own partner, it means it's like they're out of the ordinary, okay? Extraordinary people. So they have that boldness to go and do what they do without the parents' knowledge. But I've seen many, many families where this has happened, and the mother and the father, as much as they don't like it, because of the love that they have for the son or the daughter, they will give in and say, I don't like this. This is not what I wanted for you, but go ahead, have it. And for certain people, things have worked out well, but for certain people I have seen, things have not worked out well. So the nature in God is that he will wait for a period of time, but if you keep on pressing, he will give in. And this is what has happened. Man did not glorify him, did not give thanks, so he gave them over, and see what's the first thing he does. To their hearts, to sexual impurity, verse 24. Sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. He gave them over. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Because of this, because they were not praising God, he gave them, God gave them over, verse 26, to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations, relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. It was written in the first century by the Apostle Paul. God gave them over to be judged. And you know what? This is what mankind is doing. I'm sure it's ringing a bell in each and every one of our hearts. And you're missing a beat in your heart. It goes on, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind. So number one, degrading of bodies. Number two, depraved minds. Depraved minds. And what happens when you have a depraved mind? To do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Amen. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. How, how rhyming it is. Senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Some of us may think, well, I'm not there. I don't do those things. The moment you say that, you are guilty of another sin. You are guilty of another sin of judging another person. I believe one of the reasons why this degrading of bodies and depraved minds happen is because people have lost the sensitivity to sin and the consequences of sin. The seriousness, the depth of how sin can destroy your body, the sinful nature that you and I are born with. How much do you realize that? You are a sinful being before God. And here is a holy God, a righteous God, you can't see him. You can't stand before him. The wrath of God has been revealed. Degrading of bodies, depraved minds. What is God's remedy? And this is the message 
in the gospel. This is the message in the gospel. This is the good news. So this is the state of affairs. This is how it is. And God does not just leave you as, as it is hanging in there. And that's why Paul says, it's, yes, this is what it is. But don't worry. I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. To the Jew first and to the Greek. For therein, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And this is why Paul is writing. He's saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now let's see. What is the remedy? What is the remedy? Paul himself. Let's take Paul's story. What happens to Paul? Paul was living in the first century. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Jew, a great Jew. If you want to rate the Jews, he was number one. He sat under the teaching of a great rabbi called Gamaliel. And he was very zealous for the Jewish people that we all know that when a mission was given to him to go and kill the people who were following the way, he went and he was standing there when Stephen was stoned to death. So he went on a mission to kill the people who were following the way. Look at Paul's story. Just follow Paul's story. He's the one who's writing it. He's saying, I persecuted the church of God. And you know what Paul says? And that comes in Acts chapter 26. He tells a story. Paul tells a story in Acts chapter 26, verses 12 to 18. He's standing before King Agrippa. And this is another place where you see the gospel right there. He says, Verse 17, when he encountered the living Christ, this is what Christ told him. I will rescue you from your own people, the Jewish people, and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. This is the good news. In Colossians he writes, for you have been rescued from the dominion of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What happens when this good news takes effect in your life and my life is that you are moved from the kingdom of the darkness, from the power of Satan into the kingdom of light unto the power of God. That is the transaction that takes place. In the good news and the gospel, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he says, and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins, which is a part in that good news, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So what does this gospel entail? The good news. We hear so much of, about this gospel. People telling you, this is what happened. That is what happens. You come to Jesus, this is what happens. The gospel, in my opinion, in my suggestion to you this morning, has got five components. Five components. Number one, the virgin birth of Christ. We saw in Romans 1, he wrote, he was a descendant of David. He was born through Virgin Mary. The virgin birth. It was no ordinary birth. Number two, the gruesome and shameful death on the cross. In that first century, if anybody had to be put to shame or cursed, it is death on the cross. The gruesome and shameful death on the cross. Number three, the powerful resurrection from the dead. The powerful resurrection. He promised, he said, I will come back to life, and he did. Number four, the magnificent ascension. The disciples went and they saw him ascending upward to heaven and said, I will come back to you. The ascension. And it cannot escape. And we cannot escape this, the last component right here. And that is the glorious dissension. The story is still on. It's not ended. The history is supposed to be completed. 
What do I mean by the glorious dissension? I mean the second coming of Christ. So if you want to look at the gospel, what is the good news? Jesus was born, he lived, he lived a life, he died a shameful death on the cross. Why? For your sins and my sins. And that's when, when you get into the cross and see what did the cross entail? What did God do in turning his face away from him when he cried? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The wrath of God, again that concept of the judgment of God, was placed upon Jesus himself at the cross. And then the glorious, the powerful resurrection, the spirit of holiness that raised him from the dead. And after he was raised, he walked around. He was seen by people. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he was seen by the disciples, he was seen by Peter, he was seen by John, he was seen by... 500 people at one time, and then as to one who was abnormally born, so to speak, I myself saw him, and that's why Paul writes, I did not receive this gospel from any apostle or any man. I received it from Christ himself, a revelation. And that is why the book of Romans and the epistles that Paul writes are very, very crucial to our Christian walk. He said he received it from revelation, by revelation from Jesus himself. Jesus gave himself. In 1 Corinthians 11, he, he writes, For what I received, I pass on to you. And he's talking about the communion. I received it from Jesus. I, and he says, after I received it, I did not go to the apostles. I did not go there. I did my commission of going and preaching. Three years I was in Damascus in Arabia. And then Barnabas came along with him. And then took him to the council and said, there is something that's happened to this man. Though he was not with us, though he, was, he did not see Jesus himself literally on this earth, this man has gone through an amazing experience. And that is why he's an apostle of God. And here he gives this. And when Paul writes, I want us to read this one verse as we come bring this to a conclusion. I want to show you from Paul's letter to Titus, how these five components, how, what does this teach us? How you see all of this being um, concentrated in this one verse, in this gospel. And this will give us a lead on to the next week's message. As I said, I'm starting a series today called The Gospel Unplugged. And today was the message of the gospel. Next week, it's going to be the demand of the gospel. And the following week, it's going to be the command of the gospel. The message of the gospel, the demand of the gospel, the command of the gospel. And now, coming to the message of the gospel, as we have seen, the wrath of God has been revealed unto mankind. Man is degrading his bodies. He is depraved in his mind. He is foolish. His hearts are darkened. He is worshipping the created things instead of the creator. And what happens? For the grace of God that brings salvation, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, to worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, his death, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, Eager to do what is good. The grace of God has appeared, that brings salvation, has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly life. So when the good news takes a hold of you, this is what it teaches you to do. And this is why we do not see many true Christians we see more carnal Christians who claim to be Christians, but Christ is not in them. The 
The truth is that Jesus Christ, when he gets hold of your life, you will not be the same. If you are going out to kill people, you are arrogant, you are showing disrespect to people, something will happen like what happened to Paul, for he received from him. And he, something transpired, a supernatural transaction, and that is, he was moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And when he saw everything in the light, even as he was doing certain things, he knew what he was doing, and he was being able to be used by God. And here you see the virgin birth, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and the story is yet to finish because... He is yet to come. We wait for the glorious appearing of our Jesus Christ the second time. And we all know that when he comes back again, he is coming as a judge. And that will complete the gospel. That is the message. That is where we are all waiting for the message to be completed. And that will be completed when he comes back the second time. Because he says, when I come back, my rewards are with me. I will give to each person according to what he has done. You and I cannot escape from this doctrine of being judged by God. And that is why Martin Luther, he knew he was going to be judged by God. He did not know how can he stand before God and say, I'm a holy person. And when he read this, when the righteousness of Christ, that is, the just shall live by faith. When he knew that the death of Christ on the cross was for him, that it was because of him Jesus was placed on the cross, and that when he accepts that, and he says, yes, Lord, you died in my place. I am a sinner. I should be crucified on the cross. You are a holy God. I cannot live my life. I cannot stand before you. But because of Jesus whom you put on the cross, because of his righteousness, his pure life, now I can call you Abba, Father, and come to you. That's when you are saved. You have received the gospel of Christ. And truly, if this gospel has taken an effect on you, these are the three blessings. Number one, love and forgiveness. Number two, peace and contentment. Number three, joy and suff joy amidst suffering. We all have heard, oh, when you come to Christ, this is what you will get. This is what you will get. But let me just nail it down to th three primary blessings that come when you are saved. When you get into this experience of being born again. There are three blessings. Primary blessings. Number one, you receive the love of the Father because he has forgiven your sins through Christ. And you have a clear standing before God because you're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Number two, you will have a peace that passes all understanding. You will be contented. Number three, even when you go through suffering and pain, you will have a joy that will fill you to overflowing. And let me close with this illustration of this one particular song. As we are growing up in a Sunday school, in the Sunday school, they, sing, they sang this song. Love, 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 love. The gospel in one word is love. Love your neighbor as thyself. Love, love, love. Peace, 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 peace. The gospel in one word is peace. Peace that passes understanding. Peace, peace, peace. Joy, 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 joy. The gospel in one word is joy. Joy that fills to overflowing. Joy, joy, joy. Christ, 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 Christ. The gospel in one word is Christ. Love him, serve him, and adore him. The gospel in one word is Christ. Will you receive that this morning? The message of the gospel. When you hear the message, it's important that you give time to reflect. And I'm going to give you this time.
I want each and every one of us to consider. Have you really moved or experienced this supernatural transaction from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? From the power of Satan within the power of God? Have you seen your plight, your sinful, unhelp, helpless plight before this holy God? Have you truly received the message in the gospel? Are you experiencing the true blessings that come from the gospel? The love of the Father the forgiveness of sins, the peace and the contentment that comes to you, the joy that comes even amid suffering. If your heart has not been shaken this morning, if your heart has been shaken this morning, in your understanding of the good news, the message in the gospel. Would you take this time to make this transaction with your Heavenly Father? Even as the song is being sung, I want each and every one of us, if you are able to kneel at your place you can but this is a transaction between you and God God sees your heart through and through and if you need to take this time to confess that you have strayed away from him though you have received the good news at one time but then the things of the world has caught you has got you into its trap and you have lost sight of this most glorious thing of being able to stand before your heavenly Father and say, Father, thank you for your love on the cross. Thank you for accepting me as your son, as your daughter, though I should be doomed. And we want you to make that transaction right there. The Spirit of God is here, and He will apply the effects of salvation in your heart, in your life, in your soul.